Thank you. Have a seat, please. And Mr. Brandt. <clears throat> Good morning. You know, on behalf of, of Ms. Madden and her mama and daddy and Ms. Young and myself, we also appreciate y'all and what y'all have done. You know, I've tried a lot of jury trials, and inevitably you'll look over and you'll see somebody halfway asleep or, or dozing off or just not paying attention. I can sincerely say all, all of y'all, all 14, have sat and paid attention throughout this entire case, and that's what the system's all about, so we sincerely appreciate that. March the 2nd, 2011. It was a Wednesday, and it was a sad and tragic day. Miss Stewart was a beautiful little girl. I, I motioned at the screen. They had a picture of her at, at the end. She's a beautiful little girl. And her mom and daddy lost her, and they'll never get to see her again. And I don't care, right, wrong, or indifferent, who did what, what happened. That's sad. And any of you that have kids, y'all can kind of get a glimpse of what that's like, although I don't know that any of us really know what it's like to walk in somebody else's shoes until you do that. This day can best be characterized as an unfortunate series of events that led to an unforeseen result. And I believe the facts that was presented from the witness stand are a little different than what the district attorney said. You know, like I told you all that day one up there in, in Chattanooga, the general said today's the fourth day. We started last Monday. It's somewhat kind of run all together. But when we was up there in Chattanooga, I said, a lot of the stuff we don't disagree with, what they're going to say. And I ask you all, do you want me to get up and go after every single witness? Or if, if there's nothing really to dispute, just let it go as it is. And so, you know, I know that sometimes I can get on folks' nerves, or maybe I can be a little obnoxious. If there's something I've done, I ask you not to hold that against Miss Madden. But let's walk through this case. I want to remind you all one other thing before we get into the facts the Constitution of the United States of America. It's what says guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It's also what says you can go to church and worship the Lord on Sunday. It's what says that you can have a right to bear arms. It's what says you have the freedom of speech. It's what gives equality to all of us as Americans. Guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Not maybe what happened or probably what happened. You know, all of y'all have had this experience so far. We finished up the proof on Saturday. And all y'all went home and went to bed. You didn't go home. You went back to the hotel or motel, wherever you were, and you went to bed. And you had to start thinking through what had happened. And although I'm confident that none of y'all discussed it with each other, you had to be thinking. And do you know what happened that day? And if you feel like you do, then turn me off right now. But if you don't, I'd like to come at it from our standpoint. The facts leading up to that dreadful day. You know, this was May the 2nd, 2011. Back up three years, March 2nd. Thank you, General Newman. Back up three years. Ms. Stewart's just graduated high school in Memphis, Tennessee. She receives one of 15 scholarships, a very talented athlete. She comes down to MTSU. That summer, she meets Mr. Ahuna in the weight room at MTSU. Now, that same time period, Miss Madden would have been a sophomore still in, or junior still in Memphis, in high school. Come on forward into the summer before 2011. Ms. Madden's just received an academic scholarship to MTSU, always made good grades in school, took honors classes, done really well. Ms. Stewart is fixing to be a junior guard for Middle Tennessee State University, a Division I school with a good team and a lot of good, good teammates. And y'all heard them characterized as her sisters, and they loved her, and I understand that. And they lost their, what they would call their sister. And Coach Ensel lost one of his great athletes on that team. But look at what's leading up to this particular day. May 2010, 
Miss Stewart's already at Raiders Crossing and just moving into this particular apartment that Miss Madden is fixing to move into. Miss Madden has just been accepted to MTSU and gets flyers in the mail from Raiders Crossing and her and her mama and daddy decide that's going to be a place to go to school. You know, she come down, she got signed up. She's only 17, so her mama had to sign up with her because she was a minor when she signed at Raiders Crossing. Then we move on into August, and her parents get her situated in the, in the apartment there. Her parents go back to Memphis. And then that, think about that first night. <clears throat> Miss Madden's in there going over her syllabuses from class. Miss Stewart comes in, and these two young girls from Memphis have a conversation. And they realize that Miss Madden had known her while she, or didn't know her, but had knew who she was because she was an athlete a couple of years ahead of her. And you don't hear any signs of any problems. August, September, October, November, you see no signs of any trouble between these two girls. They're both excited. Miss Stewart's progressing towards being able to graduate school in another year. Miss Madden's in her first year of school. Christmas break comes along, and they both go home to spend time with their families. And they come back to MTSU after that break. Mid-January rolls around. And you know, y'all heard the testimony from the lady with the office the other day that had taken handwritten notes and then wadded them up and, and threw them away and then went back and typed it on the computer. And y'all have to make a decision as to when the conversation over Mr. Ahuna and the office was. Mr. Ahuna even told y'all that the, I said, Mr. Nuna, was it the, do you remember there being a voicemail or some conversation with Ms. Stewart earlier that day before you met with Ms. Madden? He said, yeah. So wh whatever the day was, the off at Ms. Madden's mama, being a mama, called Raiders Crossing Apartments. And I think any of us, if you step back and, and you're on the outside looking in, you can say, yeah, probably wasn't a good move for a mama's part. It happened. Miss Madden goes down there, she talks to the office. The office says, you two girls, talk this out. Miss <clears throat> Madden's at home that night. She says when she's going in, Miss Stewart's leaving, and the radio's left loud. And it's the first time that's ever happened. Miss Stewart comes in later on, and these two girls get to talking. And it, what, it appears that everything is going to be fine between the two of them. But then the testimony is that the ra it was normal for the radio to be left on after that. It was normal for it to be loud. So Miss Madden, avoiding conflict, goes, stays with her friend, Carlicia. You know, it, the whole tone changed after that day. And with with the music and with no more speaking with each other, it just started, it, it was just bad from that point, uncomfortable at a minimum from that point on. Miss Madden said she returns periodically after that. Then the week of March the 2nd, 2011, it was a Wednesday. It was the Wednesday before spring break. Now, technically spring break started on Monday, but even the registrar agreed with me that on Friday, if you didn't have any more classes, it would have been okay to get in the car with your mom and daddy and go back home. There wasn't anything going on on Saturday, Sunday. The Wednesday before spring break, she returns to get clothes and smoke pot. Now, like that or not, or think it's right or not, that's what she was going to do. Now think about this. Could you even begin to argue as they was walking from that quick sack or whatever the corner market was where they had bought some cigars that there's about to be a murder? From all the evidence in this case, could you even begin to say possibly, maybe, perhaps, probably, you know those legal burdens, the ground floor, probably? Could you even probably say there was fixing to be a problem? And the answer to that appears to be no, no signs whatsoever. The timeline hadn't started at this point with the, what the state introduced. They walk back over there, they start smoking pot. And y'all saw the timeline of events and, and what was going on with the, the tweeting and, and, and all of that stuff. And then all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. And the police officer's there. And, and he says, can I search your room? Miss Madden says, sure. But what, think about this. What happened while the police officer's there? Mr. Stewart come down the hall. 
I'm the one that called the police. He's like, ma'am, we don't need that. You need to go on back to your room. Police search. They find. What they find? Ms. Reese says it was a marijuana roach. The officer says a marijuana roach. The, but the officer says, but it was just paper. And then he says, I didn't smell any marijuana, but Detective Taylor smelled marijuana and all the police officers after that smelled marijuana. What really went on right there? I submit to you, he found marijuana. It wasn't that big of a deal. It was a small amount. I even got up there. Remember when I said, how much can you find and it still be okay under Tennessee law? And he's like, oh, well, I'm not saying that. That's what he had said when the government was up with him. I submit he found a small amount of marijuana. It wasn't that big of a deal to him. He told him to flush it, not having any idea that he, this day was ever going to unfold in the courtroom. And then he had to come back and he had to write a statement and he couldn't say that he had disposed of marijuana because what would that be? Destruction of evidence. But then, you know, I asked Detective Taylor about that and what did Detective Taylor say? Well, it has to do with when the investigation began. Well, okay. Well, when did, in this case, when did the investigation begin? When I arrived on the scene? You mean when you got there after Miss Madden was already in handcuffs? Yep, that's when the investigation began. So come on, come on back to... They're in there, they smoke pot, there's the knock at the door, the police finds what he does, he tells them to throw it away, throw out the trash, flush the marijuana... He lets Miss Madden come back to the room. Now, the testimony there is Miss Madden came into the room and went to Miss Stewart's door. Now, they had Miss Reese up here. You know, the other day they said, well, she took this knife with this charaded blade and she jammed it down her bra. And then she got out and jerked this knife out of her bra. Did they show you a picture of her, of her breast all cut up? Did they show you a picture of her bra all cut up from taking the knife out of her bra? Or what about her shirt? Did they show you any of that? And think about this for a minute. They, they had a male officer on the stand right before the female that took her clothes. And they said, sir, are you the one that took her clothes? He said, well, um, no, sir, I'm not the one that took her clothes. It was a female in there with her. But when the female come out of the room with her, they gave me her clothes. And so I'm the one that had her clothes at that point. And then the female that took her clothes, what'd she say? She said, I noticed this rip in her bra or separation along the seam. Did she tell y'all anything? Or y'all see, y'all saw the bra? Did, was it all cut up where a knife had come out? Or her breast? Did you see any of that? You know, I, I said to Miss Madden, I, I asked Detective Taylor the night before, I said, with, with the difference, I said, you're Caucasian. And she's African American. Do you, are there, is there a difference in if you get a bruise on your skin? Is there a difference in how it looks? He says, yeah. And then I and General Weitzel said, man, we got all these pictures of your body. You took all these pictures of where you were sore, where you thought you had a mark. Did you see any pictures of cuts on her breast of where she had this knife? Did you see pictures of a torn cut bra where she removed a knife from her bra? That was the first time anything had been said about that, and it don't even make sense. Now, Miss Stewart was also by the kitchen. Three people put her there. The officer Jensen, when she come out, said, I'm the one that called the police. Miss Reese, Miss Madden, they all put her by the kitchen. And Miss Madden had to walk by the kitchen to get to the bedroom, but Miss Reese didn't say, yeah, you know, I heard her walking, and then all of a sudden I heard it go quiet, or I heard her go in the kitchen. And then she started walking to the door again. So even though Miss Stewart's by the kitchen and Miss Madden passed the kitchen, I don't think that knife come from the kitchen. And I'll come back to that in a minute. There's a knock at the door. Miss Stewart opens the door. The two girls start talking. And Miss Reese says she can see Miss Madden at the beginning of the talking. She had a front row seat. Y'all saw the bedrooms are laid out there. She's sitting on the bed looking at the door. She said, I could see her. They started off talking, started getting more aggressive at each other. Next thing I know, they're fighting. She never described seeing Miss Madden pushed out in the hall. She said, I, never, I didn't see her anymore. And she said, I got up and I ran in there to see what's going on. And they're fighting. And I ran back, and I was so scared I was going to jump out a third-story window. Why was she going to jump out a third-story window? 
because Miss Stewart was fixing to whoop her too? She heard her say that. Now, does that sound like an evenly matched fight where one person's got the wherewithal to say, wait, right, where your little friend go? I'm fixing to whoop her too. Sounds like it's one-sided at that point. And then next thing that happens, Miss Reese, I said, as soon as you quit hearing noise, where was Miss Madden? She's at the door immediately. And then all these bizarre, unusual events start to unfold at that point. And when you look at the pictures in this room, everything's close together. Now, I ask about measurements, and all they wanted to do is get up here and swing at me. Well, when was Mr. Brandon hired, and why didn't he go out there and do it? Well, with all due respect, they got the burden of proof, not me. Now, and how in the world I'm going to go in there and measure a bunch of stuff they've seized and got, they seized the day before and got into evidence, I don't know. But that's just a way for them to take the monkey off their back that it's messed up. That's okay. People make mistakes. You even heard Mr. Finley say, I sure would have liked to know the dimensions inside the room and what the location of this and this was. But that's their responsibility. They have the burden of proof. And it never, ever shifts. And they still have it. Everyone described a fight. Miss Macklin, y'all remember her testimony? The one that was best friends, hadn't talked to her in four months, but knew an awful lot about her from a two-minute conversation. And she, she talked about that she heard, she heard some arguing, heard the phone drop, and then she could hear Miss Madden loud and clear. Now, what's that consistent with? She heard Miss Stewart say, get out of my room. She heard Miss Madden say, I'm trying, I'm trying. What's that consistent with? Trying to abandon the situation? trying to remove yourself from a situation. You know, think about Mr. Ahuna. He said, when I saw it, I knew they had to have got to fighting. And he didn't, he, what did he tell you all about Miss Madden? I rarely ever saw her. Who did he know real well? Miss Stewart. And what was his immediate thought? They had to have got to fighting. The argument, why'd you call the police on me? Why'd you call the office on me? It's silly that we're here today over, over this. But this didn't have to happen. The apartment, we listened to the apartment complex. They had tried to get these girls moved around or somebody had made a request and they just simply didn't do it. It's sad we're here over something this trivial, but we are. And then let's talk about this timeline a little bit. I'm not going to put, I can put it up here on the screen and read through it again, but y'all have seen all of that. But think about these important times. At 6.04, Miss Stewart is on the phone with Miss Macklin for 4 minutes and 45 seconds. So that gives y'all some idea of the time this fight was going on. So that would get it to 6.08.45, 6.09, the fight's going on. And then however long it goes on, which is probably a real brief period of time, truth be known. And then, what about this? What time does Miss Reese call 911? 6.45. Now, I think that the, what they introduced on the timeline showed it was 6.43 or 6.44. The 911 dispatcher testified 6.45. So you've got something between 6.10 and 6.45. 35 minutes it took Miss Reese to call 911. Now, y'all think about that bell curve again that we all, and maybe it was just me in school, that they'd always draw that bell curve, and I was always over here on this end of it, but there was people here in the middle, and that's where the average of the class was. What would the average person do if you just saw a fight and you knew they were dead? And, and y'all do know Miss Reese knew she was dead, right? She didn't want to tell you that, but her friends did. And that's why they told her to call 911. What would the average person do? Wouldn't you think you'd pick up the phone, a reasonable person, and call 911? 
And interesting enough, the law provides that you put yourself in that, person, that particular person's shoes under what was going on. 30 to 38 minutes she waits before she calls 911. Her friends say she's hysterical. Y'all listen to the tape. Uh, yeah, I, I want to report a fight. Okay, ma'am, well, what kind of, what, what, tell me about it. Where's this at? I don't really know. It's up on the third floor at Raiders Crossing. Well, okay, ma'am, can you tell me who's in it? No, I, I can't tell you that. Well, can you tell me? No, I can't tell you who I am. I just want to report a fight. That's the 911 call y'all listen to. It's not hysterical. Uh, um, somebody's, somebody's dead up here. I think y'all need to get out here quick. Y'all, please, come on. I don't know what the apartment is, but I'll meet you up at the road. I'll show you where it's at. It's none of that. It's not what you would expect it to have been by a person that wasn't even involved. She'd been threatened, but she wasn't even involved in this. Think about Dr. McMaster, <clears throat> a brilliant lady, unequivocally brilliant. She made some mistakes. She didn't even have the mark behind the ear in her autopsy report. People make mistakes in what they do, but sometimes it's just not intentional. But what did she tell you? What's the difference in a cut and a stab? The depth of the wound. If the wound is deeper than it is wide, it's a stab. If the wound is wider than it is deep, it's a cut. Stab, cut. Now, there was one stab wound with a maximum depth of two inches with a knife that was, I've got it somewhere over here in my notes, four and a half, a four and a half inch blade. And it goes in two inches. But, but yet she's trying to kill her. She's knowingly trying to kill her. And that's why you see all these hard stabs that's consistent. It's not true. But then today the government's theory's even gone more. After she stabbed her and she fell on the ground, then she got on the ground and scraped her on the shoulder. Does that come anywhere near making any lick of sense? I'd submit to you that when the knife come off the bed and she was getting it over around her, that's probably when this occurred. <coughs> and truth be known, although they counted those as separate marks, some of those marks would have occurred during the same event, like a knife coming up or a knife going back down. That, that's my belief about what happened. You all get to judge the facts. They had three people from the TBI. They brought a man in from Alabama. He was a very smart man. Did you hear any of them? Did you hear them ask one single person? And an expert can give you their opinion. If y'all notice, the judge would say, Mr. Brandon, any questions? I would say no, because they're very smart people. Okay, I'm going to let them give their opinion. Did you hear them ask one person? Sir, ma'am, can you give me your opinion on how this happened? Can you give me your opinion on the order that these marks occurred? Can you tell us, did she stab her once two inches with a four and a half inch knife and when she fell on the floor, get down and stab her some more or scrape her with the knife some more? Isn't that what happened? Did you hear that? No. Dr. McMaster told you that it clipped the aorta. The aorta, you know, there's arteries and veins. Arteries send out oxygenated blood to the body and its organs. Veins return, veins return the blood from the organs back to the aorta and the heart to be oxygenated to go back out. And I said, well, Dr. McMaster, would that be an immediate thing? She says, no, it wouldn't be. The only thing immediate is when you get somebody in the head. I said, well, it wouldn't have been long, would it? She said, no, it wouldn't have been long until death come about. I also asked her where the stab wound was. You remember her saying it was the first intercoastal space. The space between your ribs is called intercoastal space, and it's, and it's numbered for the rib just superior or above it. And it was the first one, that area right there. It was of moderate strength. She didn't say anything about it would be anything near enough to bend a knife. No bone connected at any point, yet we've got a bent knife. Where'd that come from?
And then the interview that Miss Madden gave with the police, and I probably missed some stuff, and I'm sorry about that. It's just, it's all starting to run together um, at some point. But the interview with the police, and I'm gonna come up, cover these jury instructions a minute, and, it, and they tell you to take it from her standpoint. At the end of the interview with the police, what does she ask? Where's my clothes? What? Are you kidding me? Where's your clothes? You want to know where your clothes are? But yet they want to talk about she was so calm. Well, what, 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 would, what would the other side of it look like? That would have made something out of that if she had been out there all broke down. Who knows? I, I, all, I, all I can say is I know I have no idea what I would act like if I had stabbed somebody while I was getting my hind end whooped and I had never, ever, ever been in a lick of trouble before, I had never, ever visited the police station before, I've never been in any kind of a fight before, but I've got a medical condition with my eyes and I haven't had my glasses and my, it's been throbbing and all of a sudden I've gotten somebody hitting me in the head. What do you do? Now, looking at it now, should there have been another choice made? Yeah, there should have. But at the time, what do you do? And why was that knife bent? And where is the other piece of handle? That's back to, well, Mr. Brandon should have been out there looking for it. Well, no, the government should have looked for it. But you know what? It was just like many things in this case. If it was a piece of evidence or information that was going to hurt them, they never mentioned it to you. They skipped right past it and hope I never saw it. But I did. Where, where was that? I submit to you, it's part of the reason I believe, I don't believe that knife came out of the kitchen. Even though I could say Miss Stewart was by the kitchen by three people's testimony, I think the knife was in her room. I think she'd used it before that day. That's why the handle was broke. That's why it was bent. That's why it was on her bed. And I submit to you that that's an act of aggression. You're going to come bopping out. I'm the one that called the police. And then you're going to put a knife on your bed and things don't go the way you plan on them going. And then you're beating somebody in the head and all of a sudden what you brought out gets turned around on you. And they're going to sit and talk about first degree murder? <clears throat> Remember Coach Enzel? Talked about how strong willed Miss Stewart was and tough. And they talked about this candy phone. And other than saying Miss Stewart was deceptive and there was another side to her than what we saw, I don't have any idea what the purpose of telling us about a candy phone was. They took up the real phone. They, they took up a fake phone so they could do whatever they wanted to on their real phone because we had team rules that none of them abided by. But you know, I think this is kind of the tell of the tape. You remember what he said? She was in her junior year, and I walked up to her, and I was talking to her about free throws, and she finally listened to me. And I said, Coach Enzo, you've been trying to get her to learn that for two and a half years, haven't you, sir? Yeah. strong-minded, going to do what she wanted to do. You remember Miss Jones, one of the basketball players? She was full of energy that day. She was all fired up that day. Miss Madden still got blood on her hands. Two things of dishwashing detergent sitting on the sink, and she still got blood on her hands and blood on her clothes. And yet, y'all, she's going to try to make a getaway? And there's a flight jury instruction that the judge read to y'all a minute ago. The, the testimony from Miss Madden, her mama, and Mr. Anuna was that she was in the apartment. Mr. Anuna come in, was hollering at her, and he should have been hollering at her. He lost the woman he loved. I don't fault him a bit for hollering. I don't fault him for running her down either, or trying to. But her mama's like, run, run, run. Her mama don't know what's happening. And she runs and gets down behind a car, hears some more yelling, takes off running again. And then you had different versions of what happened there. The, the police officer that got her said he ran 20, I don't know if he's saying 25 or 75 yards. One of the people said he ran and he yelled and she stopped. Everybody says she stopped before he got to her. And then one man says she stopped when she got in the grass and he walked over there and got her. 
I don't know exactly what that looked like, but that's the evidence that you received. Now I want to go through these jury instructions briefly. Ms. Madden has a presumption of innocence. The law presumes that the defendant is innocent of the charges against her. This presumption remains with her through every stage of the trial and is not overcome unless from all of the evidence you're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that she's guilty. That's what you're starting from. Now, the destruction of evidence. The defendant knew an investigation was in progress. When did Detective Taylor tell you the investigation was in progress? When he arrived after she was already in custody. I'd submit to you that that watch it out. Remember the example of a baseball game? And if you miss a base, I don't know how many of y'all watch baseball. Quite frankly, I lost money back in the 80s when I was supposed to go to a ball game and they all struck because their millions of dollars wasn't enough for them and didn't get to go. And so I haven't watched a lot of baseball since then. But when I did watch it, what would happen? You, there's a big play and everything's going around and the coach notices the man skips over second base. He's taking off running and he mistouches second base. And what I remember always seeing happen is that after the dust settles down, the pitcher gets the ball, he steps off the mound, and he turns around and he throws it second base, and the umpire calls him out, the man that was running. They give you all the example of a baseball game. They told you all they have, to, they have to touch every base beyond a reasonable doubt. Not maybe, not probably, not by preponderance of the evidence, not by clear and convincing evidence, but by guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And I submit they hadn't touched ever base on any of these charges. So an investigation's in progress and the defendant concealed a cutting instrument. Now, General Watson may get up here and argue, well, she concealed it. Yeah, I know that had already happened, but don't, don't, no, y'all don't pay attention to that. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. During her interview, at the end of it, during the last 15 minute segment, the police asked her about the knife. And she said she didn't know. Now what she told them was, I'd say it's outside somewhere because I spent a lot of time outside. I walked around outside a whole lot. Then he says to her, we found a knife in the dumpster. Yeah, that's probably it. I, like I said, I was outside. And I submit that's not, they've not touched every base. And if they've not touched every base beyond a reasonable doubt, it's not guilty. And the same thing with the attempt to tamper. It's the, same, it's the same charge, just you're attempting to do that, but there still has to be an investigation in progress. And, you, and if you do say, well, I'm not going to care about that, or I'm going to say she concealed it during that last 10 to 15 minute of the interview, you still have to find that she attempted to do something and that she, she knew that she was misleading them. And I submit there's not evidence here for that. Now, intent to kill. You got one stab wound. two inches with a four and a half inch knife, less than half of the length of the knife, and that's an intent to kill? <clears throat> General Newman, he explained to y'all what the law was on first degree murder. In a premeditated act, one act done after the exercise of reflection and judgment. They didn't show you that. I guess they're so confident on this, they didn't talk about the other ones, but I'd like to address them. Second degree murder. That the defendant unlawfully killed the victim and the defendant acted knowingly. She knew while she's in this fight getting slung around the room, she knew she was going to kill Miss Stewart. Knowingly means a person acts with an awareness that their conduct is reasonably certain to cause the death of the individual. Two inches, it's not a, all the way through. I might could start to agree with it at that point, but it's half the length of the knife. But yet they're going to say she knowingly did that. The next one's voluntary manslaughter. And listen to this, that the defendant killed the victim, that the defendant acted intentionally or knowingly. You still got them same two issues there. And then the third element, the killing resulted from a state of passion produced by adequate provocation, 
sufficient to lead a reasonable person to act in an irrational manner. Sufficient to lead a reasonable person to act irrational. And I submit that it's not that. Number one, they still have to show the intentional or knowing. And number two, what's irrational about somebody that's never been in a fight, never been in any trouble, never been to the police station, never had any contact with the police, and they're getting whooped? Detective Taylor said she, she was swollen. <coughs> she had a mark on her face. She had scratches over here. She previously had a problem with her eyes. It's throbbing. She's get, I'm not going to hit myself anymore, but she's getting hit in the head. It's not that. What's next? Reckless homicide. That the defendant killed the victim. That the defendant acted recklessly. Okay, well, what's recklessly? Recklessly means a person acts recklessly when the person is aware of, she's got to find her aware of, but consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the victim will be killed. Do you think she consciously disregarded an awareness that Miss Stewart was going to be killed? And get a load of this. It's what an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the accused person's standpoint. Then the next one, criminally negligent homicide. The conduct resulted in death and two, acted with criminal negligence. Okay, well what's criminal negligence? It means a person acts with criminal negligence when the person ought to be aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the person will be killed. The risk must be of such a nature that failure to perceive it constitutes gross deviation. You got you're sitting here being beat, and all, and you and you stick somebody to it. They can't get past that. How the knife went in, whether it was this, whether it was this, whether it was that, arguably. But they can't get past. They got a four and a half inch blade now. I'm not talking about the handle. Also, a four and a half inch blade that goes less than halfway into Miss Stewart. They don't meet that standard. And then self-defense. If a, if a defendant was not engaged in unlawful activity and was in a place where they had the right to be, there would be no duty to retreat. And then the rest of it goes, before threatening or using force intended or likely to cause death, if the defendant, if Ms. Madden had a reasonable belief that she was in imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury. Now, you may say, well, I don't think she, she I, I understand the eye and I believe that. I understand Mr. Stewart was hitting her and I. I've seen the pictures. But what is serious bodily injury? Serious bodily injury it is, well, I don't see my, oh, here it is. It means bodily injury that involves substantial risk of death, protracted unconsciousness, extreme physical pain. Think she was in extreme physical pain? And you may say to me, I don't sound fair. Well, and I, I say this with all respect to you, y'all the ones that agreed on the front end that you'd uphold the Constitution. Y'all the ones that agreed you'd make the government show guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Y'all the ones that said, no, I'm not giving up my right, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, equality, right to bear arms. This is not a car wreck. You're trying to decide, you know, which one's more at fault, what do I need to do here? Reasonable doubt. After all the, after you consider all the proof in the case, all the facts, air all the evidence, an inability to let your mind rest easily as to the certainty of guilt. Ladies and gentlemen, y'all have already had that experience. I don't know what it was. We got done Saturday night. 
What we're doing now is not evidence. Y'all have already had the experience. They put a picture of a pretty little girl on the screen and it makes you want to cry. She was pretty. Her parents will never ever get to hug her again. And that's sad. But that's what they were trying to evoke out of you is sadness, prejudice, sympathy. You know, at some point you're going to go home. I submit you've already had this experience. But at some point, y'all going to go home. And you're going to sit down in your recliner and you're going to kick it back. Are you going to sit on the couch, get ready to turn the TV on? Or are you going to lay down in the bed? And we all have this experience where you start rolling the events of that particular day through your mind. Do you know what happened? Well, yeah, Mr. Brandon, no, I don't know, but that's not fair. They lost their baby girl. They did. But with the same conviction that you protect your right to worship the Lord, with the same conviction that you want equality, with the same conviction that you want freedom and right to bear arms, it's the same guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And they haven't shown you all that. And I'm asking you all to return a verdict of not guilty as to all charges. Thank you, and, and sincerely thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mr. Brandon. All it is, we'll take a 10 minute break from our discussions, not to discuss the case among yourselves, okay? I'll call you back in 10 minutes. Everybody rise, please.